happen to agree with this statement and feel comfortable doing so, I want you to say amen. We are blessed here at Keller with some wonderful Bible class teachers. And I'm so thankful for every single one of them, including those who teach our children, maybe especially those who teach our children. They often have a thankless task, but they do a world of good. Anytime I think about Sunday school for little kids, I'm reminded of the story of the little boy who came home from church one Sunday. And his dad asked him, well, tell me what you learned about in Bible class. He said, well, it's nothing to it, Dad. I learned about Moses and the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. He said, really? Well, tell me about how it happened. He said, oh, it's no big deal. He said, the children of Israel get to the Red Sea, and Moses uh, doesn't know how to cross it until he has an idea. He has his engineers come in and build a suspension bridge across the Red Sea, and they all cross over very safely from Pharaoh's army. And then when Pharaoh's army gave pursuit, he brought in his demolition experts and blew the bridge up. Dad said, surely your teacher did not tell you that story in class. He said, oh no, if I told you the version she told me, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I'd like to encourage you to open your Bibles to Psalm 119 this evening. Psalm 119. I hope that you have been in class on Sunday mornings as we have been going through the Psalms. I hope that that study has been as meaningful to you as it has been to me. Whenever I think about Psalm 119, I instantly think about several things. One, this is in fact the longest chapter in the Bible in terms of verses. This is a very lengthy chapter, and it is organized in a very unique way. If you will notice in your Bible, most likely, the psalm is offset by groups of eight verses. And there is perhaps a Hebrew letter at the beginning of each set of eight verses. On there, though we cannot tell in English, in Hebrew, the first word of each verse begins with that one letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And this is a masterful literary way of praising God. And specifically, Psalm 119 is a hymn of praise for God's word. In fact, I think that within all but maybe three to five verses out of the 176, all but about three or five, uh, there contains at least some mention of God's word or God's law or God's precepts or God's commandments or statutes or some, some synonym for God's word, God's law. And so this is a hymn of praise to God for the word that he has given us. The other thing that I think about is, based on my study of the New Testament, whenever we think about the law, especially in an Old Testament sense, that often comes with some negative connotations. I mean, am I right, especially if you've studied it in light of Romans and Galatians, law has a negative connotation. We think, oh, the old law and all the things that they had to do. And, you know, you study Hebrews and the law, the law, the law, and the sacrifices. And we're so glad that we live under Christ's law today. If we're not careful, we can lose sight of the fact that the law in and of itself was a wondrous thing. The law given to Moses, the law that the psalmist here in Psalm 119 praises. And so it's not all bad. There is much to commend it. I'm particularly struck, though, the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in that particular passage, Paul is winding down his letter. And he says to Timothy in chapter 3, he said, As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed knowing whom you've learned it from, how from, the, from early infancy, from childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. And only then does he say all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, uh, equipped for every good work. Paul was struck by the fact that Timothy was a boy who had been brought up on the book, on the Bible. And he was grateful for the influence of Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. He was grateful for those women who had raised Timothy in the scriptures that he was now wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. And so whether in the Old Testament or the New, we need to recognize that God's word instructs us in studying that word but also praises God to, that he has given us his word so that we know what to do in order to please him. If you've studied world religions, all going all the way back to the beginning of time, you've noticed that for a long time in paganism, and even today, people that worship pagan gods, one of the grave problems that they have to deal with is oftentimes they don't know exactly what to do in order to please their gods. We don't have that problem. 
For God has clearly revealed himself in his word so that we know we can know what to do in order to bring him glory and honor and praise in our lives. There, there is a, this sense of wondering. Some of you, and, and I have as well, we've known people in the past, maybe a family member uh, or, or a friend that, that we didn't know how to please them. Have you ever known people like that? You just you got exasperated, you want to throw up your hands. I just don't know what to do to make you happy. Thank God for the fact that our God is not like that, that he has clearly revealed himself to us, his nature and his character and his will and his wonder. And what I'd like to do this evening is to go through Psalm 119. We're not going to study in depth all 176 verses. Uh, I believe in punishment, but not cruel and unusual punishment. We're not going to look at all 176 statements, but I want to isolate just seven, just seven statements in Psalm 119 and draw some application from them so that we can perhaps have a greater appreciation for God's word and the role that it plays in our lives. In other words, again, my point tonight is to simply go through Psalm 119, look at seven statements, talk about uh, their meaning and application so that we might have a greater appreciation for the role that God's word plays in our lives so that we will be more faithful to it and find the joy and the happiness that God intends every student of the word to find in their search. The first one, if you will, Psalm 119 and verse 2. Psalm 119 and verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. This statement reminds me that God's word is not a, a moral code to be mindlessly obeyed, but rather it is a, a way of life that is to be wholeheartedly adopted. True obedience brings joy. Obedience, to put it another way, obedience that is not from the heart really isn't obedience at all. Some of you in your Christian walk perhaps have not discovered the joy of the Christian life because you were trying to give, you know, passive obedience to God, to all of his rules, but you weren't willing to give God your heart. And, and that's a little bit, you know, out of sorts. It's, it's backwards. It's getting the cart before the horse. God wants our heart, and he knows if he has our true heart, then obedience will come with it. It's, it's very similar to the relationship between a parent and a child. If, if your children are obeying your, your every word, but you know that they don't love you, you know, you recognize that that, that obedience doesn't mean nearly as much as if it were coming from the heart. I think back to that model that my father gave me, so grateful for his influence in my life. And, and I think about the fact that as I got older, I recognized that I obeyed him more and more, not because I had to, not because he hovered over me the threat of punishment, but rather the fact that I loved him deeply and sincerely. And even now, he's dead and gone for 11 years. He couldn't punish me if he wanted to, but I still obey the things that he taught me because I love him so much and want to honor his memory. And so it is with our Lord. He wants us to obey him from the heart. Obedience that doesn't come from the heart denies God the one thing that he wants most of all, and that is a deep and abiding, affectionate relationship with his children. Obedience is praise to God. And so I appreciate this verse in Psalm 119 that talks about how that those who seek God with their whole heart, they are indeed truly blessed. Is your relationship with Scripture one that is kind of like doing chores and crossing stuff off a list, or do you search the word because you want to draw closer to the heart of its author? Something to think about. Number two, I want us to look at verse 18, Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. How many of you have ever read through the latter part of Exodus and Leviticus? Raise your hands, any of you, okay? Uh, okay, put your hands down. Another question. How many of you have ever endeavored to read the Bible in a year or a certain amount of time? And Genesis went really well because Genesis is awesome. You know, Genesis is really, really awesome. And then the first part of Exodus, really kind of awesome. You know, you got plagues and Red Sea and people dying. It's really awesome. But then you came to the latter part of Exodus and the tabernacle and the laws and Leviticus and all the laws and the leprosy and the oozing wounds. And you decided, you know, I think I'm going to be Muslim for the rest of my life. How many of you ever had that experience? All right? No one, okay. A couple of you are brave enough. You know, I, every time somebody tells me they're going to read through the Bible in a year or a certain amount of period, I say, well, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, Genesis is great. Exodus, most of it's great. Latter part of Exodus, you're, you're going to get there and you're going to go, okay, I'm going to find something else to do now. You know, it's, it's a difficult. I've read through Leviticus several times because mainly I was bored and it was either that or a root canal. Uh, and so I chose to read through Leviticus. And I'm telling you, there's some parts in there that you think, how in the world did this make it into the Bible? 
And so when I read this statement, you know, I'm thinking, how can you say that you have beheld wondrous things in God's law? Because when you get to that part of Exodus that talks about the ox that gored the neighbor and what to do with the ox and all those other things, I don't find that particularly wondrous. But as we go throughout scripture, we find that God in many ways used his law to provide for his people. That in some ways provision precedes obedience. I think about the story of Ruth, how she was faithful to her mother-in-law and coming back with Naomi to Bethlehem. And yet God, because of her faithfulness, because of Naomi's faithfulness, because primarily of Boaz's faithfulness in the early part of Ruth too, God provided for Naomi, God provided for Ruth, God provided for Boaz. He provided for his people because they were faithful. Particularly, there was provision in the old law that said that when you're reaping a harvest, you know, leave a little something out on the extremes of the field. Don't take it all. And, and if you drop some, leave it there for people that are poor and disenfranchised and needy. Leave it behind so that they can come along and pick it up and they can feed themselves. This was a law in the law of Moses. And Boaz, even in the period of the judges, when nobody was really faithful to anything, in the period of the judges, Boaz was a righteous man, a worthy man, a moral man, one who kept the law. He was faithful. And in that faithfulness, God provided for his people. Obedience precedes provision. And so when the psalmist here says that he beholds wondrous things from God's law, I think he's talking about how that when people obey God's law, he sees wondrous things happen. Some of you have struggled in life wanting God to show up in a, in a special way, in a powerful way, to do the unexpected, to get you out of really, uh, a really bad jam. Sometimes we find that the way that God works in our lives is through our obedience to what he has said to do. We'll talk to the teenagers for a little bit. This is going to be fun. One of the things that is very easy to do when you go off to college is stop going to church. Uh, we had a joke at Fred Hardeman that uh, someone attended the Box Springs congregation. And Zach, I don't know if I ever told you this or not, but, but around Fred Hardeman, there are several churches that, have the, that they have the last name Springs, like Bethel Springs and all these others. So for all of my freshman year, I thought Box Springs was an actual church somewhere in the rural areas around Fred Hardeman. And I would hear of people that went to Box Springs on Sunday, and I'm like, I think I'm going to go check them out next Sunday. Had no idea. It's really easy to allow your church attendance to fall off. And I'm going to tell you, that's a tremendous mistake, and here's why. If you are faithful in attending a congregation during your, your college years, you're going to find that they will love you and take care of you in ways that you can't even imagine at this point in your life. Throughout my entire life, I have seen God do wondrous things because I was simply a part of his church. Sarah and I have seen God do wondrous things because we are a part of the fellowship of the saints. We don't know how people survive tragedies like this without the church. I, I simply don't. And so when the psalmist here says that I behold wondrous things out of your law, open my eyes so that I can see them, I think he's talking about this idea that, that he knows that God can do incredible things in our lives and, and he wants him to open his eyes up so that he can see them. And he knows that by obeying God's law, God does some tremendous things. Now, it's not as if our obedience is the magic potion that activates God's power. God acts separate and apart from us in whatever way that he chooses. But I'm telling you, if we are not faithful and obedient to what God has called us to do, we limit the ways that he will do wondrous things in our lives. And I appreciate the psalmist bringing this to our attention. The next two verses that I want us to look at are found in verses 75 and 28. Notice, if you will, first verse 75. He says, I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. Now, to me, that's an odd statement. In your faithfulness, you have afflicted me. And then bumping back up to verse 28, my soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. I think this is a reminder that God brings us through trials and valleys, not in spite of his love or faithfulness, but because of his word and faithfulness. In this particular passage, David sees the word as a great source of comfort and strength because it reminds him of God's steadfast love. But it's hard for me to accept this idea that, that God afflicts us in his faithfulness. 
I got to tell you, I don't even want to know what it's like to be afflicted by God in his faithlessness. But David here talks about being afflicted. The psalmist talks about being afflicted in your faithfulness. But then he says, strengthen me according to your word. I believe that God brings upon our lives seasons of testing, just as he did for Abraham, just as he did for Israel. God brings upon us seasons of testing and trial, but he does so because he is faithful to us. And perhaps he does those things because he wants to prove to us that he will be faithful to us in times of trial and also to perhaps push us to the book once again. Many of us can recount times in our life when perhaps we weren't living bad lives, but maybe our Christianity was on autopilot. Can't that happen sometimes? Our Christianity was on autopilot. We were simply going through the motions and nothing was really bad. Nothing was really right. We're just kind of coasting. But then something happens. Something jars us from our sleepless or our sleepfulness in our Christianity. And we're sent back to the word, back to the book. And there's a season of refreshing in which we're craving the word of God once again, because either something good has happened or something bad has happened, but something has happened. And the psalmist here has this idea that, that God sometimes afflicts us because he is faithful to us. He wants to build us back up according to his word. Will you allow God to do that? Will you allow God to be faithful to you in afflicting you so that he can strengthen you according to his word? This is a difficult thing to think about, but God seeks to do this for all of us because he wants us to be stronger, better, more faithful followers of him. Notice, if you will, then verses 98 through 100 of Psalm 119. This is perhaps... My favorite section of Psalm 119, of course, we're familiar with verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm, 98 verse, uh, uh, Psalm 119 verses 98 through 100. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Here the psalmist identifies three people that he believes he has bested or three people that he is superior to because he has been faithful in studying the word and also faithful in obeying it, that he has meditated on it, he, uh, he appreciates it, he is reflecting on it, and he is obeying the word of the Lord. Number one, he talks about his enemies. Are there people in your life that give you a hard time? Are there people in life that... Have, you know, make it possible for you to have a bad day. You know, when we talked about our enemies, we would often think of people living in a foreign country, perhaps the Middle East or somewhere else. That's usually what we think about when we think of, of enemies. But to borrow the phrase, you know, we have to worry about enemies foreign and domestic. Sometimes our enemies go to work with us. Sometimes our enemies go to school with us. Sometimes our enemies wear the last name in-law. Some of our enemies go to church with us at times. The psalmist says, I am greater and superior to my enemies because of the word of God. He also says, I'm superior or I'm wiser, I'm smarter than the educated, not just the enemies, but the educated, because of your word. You ever thought about that? There's a lot of smart people walking around with PhDs after their name, and they've done a lot of research and a lot of work and a lot of toil and a lot of study to earn that magnificent degree. But because they are not faithful to the word, they're not nearly as smart as they think they are. That's what this psalm is talking about. Whereas you and I know people that perhaps never even finished high school, perhaps never even made it past the seventh, eighth, or ninth grade, and yet because they were people of the book, they had wisdom beyond our wildest imaginations. They never had fancy degrees, but boy, they were wise when it came to salvation in Christ Jesus because they had been students of the book their entire lives. We've known people like that. The last thing, though, that I want to mention, and this is perhaps going to be the most... Uh, tense or awkward statement in the Psalms, in Psalm 119, I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Isn't it really easy as we grow old to become more and more sinister or sarcastic about the younger generation? Is that something that just naturally happens? I, I, I don't know, because obviously I'm just 30, so I don't know anything yet. But there seems to me that there's this idea in which no matter what age we're at, we always think that the older generation doesn't get it and that the younger generation behind us is going to ruin everything. I'm only 30, so I have my own opinions that I won't divulge right now about the older generation. 
But I look at the younger generation, the guys that are coming out of school these days, they're 20 and 23, you know, just seven years younger than I am, and I just think to myself, oh boy. And so I don't think, you know, no matter how old you are, there's always a strong tendency to look down on people that are younger than you and be a little bit disenfranchised with people that are older than you. In our culture, and particularly in the South, and this is the way it should be, we are taught to show remarkable respect to the older generation and to honor them. And you're very much worthy of that if you're part of the older generation. But would you set aside some pride for a moment and appreciate what the psalmist is saying in this verse? I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Have you ever gotten in an argument with someone and realized pretty quickly that you're wrong, but you didn't have the guts to admit it because the person that you were arguing with was younger than you and therefore didn't know nothing, but clearly they did? And have you ever noticed that the argument never goes your way when somebody brings the Bible into it? You ever notice that? I had an elder at a congregation that I worked for previously that was getting very frustrated with me one night in a meeting. He did not think that I was handling a situation properly. He didn't think that I was responding in the way that I should respond. And it was bothering him that for all of his objections, I was marshalling up a scripture in response. He finally got upset and he said to me these words. He said, Michael, your problem is that you don't recognize that there's the Bible and then there's real life. I didn't know what to say to that. What I should have said is, no, sir, with all due respect, there's the Bible and then everything else is a deluded fantasy. Wisdom is not the unique right or the exclusive right of the aged or the educated. Wisdom is the possession of all those who commit themselves to the word and particularly commit themselves to obeying it. And so whether you're 13, 43, or 93, the Bible says you're smarter than everybody else in the world if you have committed yourself to studying the word of God and obeying it with your whole heart. Brethren, we either believe that or we don't. And so I love the, the tenseness of this passage in which he talks about how that I understand more than the aged for I keep your precepts. So if you want to be better than your enemies, better than the educated and better than your elders, the psalmist says, commit yourself to the word and obeying it. Number five, I want us to look at Psalm 119 verse 120 in which he says, my flesh trembles for you for and I am afraid of your judgments. Let me tell you something, if you don't fear God, you don't know him very well. And as we study and reflect on scripture, there will be inevitably times when we tremble at God's greatness and his holiness. In the young adult class on Sunday morning, we looked at Psalm 97, and one of the reasons I love that Psalm so much is it talks about the earth and its physical response to God's presence. The earth trembles, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord. And to think about the earth convulsing so violently that it, there's an earthquake and the mountains are just melting down into the sea at the Lord's presence, it's a reminder that you cannot be in God's presence without being awestruck by His holiness and grandeur. And inevitably, because we stand in awe of that, we are going to be convicted. When I sin, I want to be haunted by the Lord's righteousness. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. You see, I believe that shame and guilt are two things that the devil uses to drive a wedge between ourselves and God. But shame and guilt are also tools that God uses to tell us that something is not right and we had better repent because this is not the way I meant for you to live your life, walking around in shame and guilt all the time. Shame and guilt function for our spiritual beings the same way that pain functions for the physical body. We don't like pain. None of us like pain. And there's this huge, massive market in the U.S. to help us manage our pain. Everything from Advil and Tylenol and ibuprofen all the way up to the really, really good stuff that you can't get without a written authorization from Congress, pretty much. We don't like pain. But we understand that pain, in one sense, is good because it tells us 
something is wrong with our body. And we understand the danger when the nerves in our bodies go bad and we lose our feeling. We understand that's bad because our body doesn't know how to alert itself to pain in a particular area. And so it is with shame and guilt. God has wired us to feel those emotions when things are wrong spiritually. And we need to learn to be afraid of God's judgments that our flesh trembles because we recognize that He is holy and we are not. And the Bible then would have us run into God's arms seeking solace and forgiveness and salvation. Number six this evening, I want us to look at Psalm 133. The psalmist says, Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Sin and Satan seek to master us, but when you and I saturate our lives with Scripture, there's a sense in which we are keeping the slavery of sin at bay. You ever wondered how the world might be different today if Eve had treasured in her heart the prohibition not to partake of that one tree? That if she had hidden God's word away in her heart, if she had meditated on it, if she had memorized it, if she had made it so. Have you ever wondered how the world, how history, the entire history of human experience might be different had Eve never sinned in the garden and Adam with her? Sin means slavery. Slavery means bondage. Bondage means death. And in this psalm, in this verse, the psalmist is asking God to use his promises, to use scripture, to use the word to keep him from becoming enslaved or allowing sin to have dominion over him. Oftentimes we think of sin as violating a checklist of things or some other type of metaphor, and yet sin is a violation of God's holiness. But it's also an act that is done to further the kingdom of Satan. And when you think of sin and death and Satan in terms of kingdom and country, there's a little bit different aspect that comes along with it. It's recognizing that I'm fighting for the wrong team. I'm fighting for the wrong army, the wrong side, the wrong general. And we recognize that sin is a master that wants to enslave where Christ wants to liberate and free. We know people in our lives whose lives have been enslaved to sin through addiction or through bad habits and tempers and all sorts of things. We know entire families that lay enslaved to sin because they cannot break free, break free because they don't have access to the power of Christ. When we saturate ourselves with the Word of God, we make it a lot more difficult for sin to still enslave us. Number seven, finally, and the lesson will be yours this evening. I want us to look at the very last verse of Psalm 119. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. All of us know wonderful men and women who did their best to raise their children in the Lord, and for whatever reason, their children still walked away from Christ and His church at a certain age in life. All of us know those people. We saw them raise their children. We saw them bring their children to Bible class and worship. We saw their children grow up and do all sorts of activities with the youth group at church. We all had positive feelings and thoughts about that family. Perhaps we saw them as a family to emulate and copy. And when they walked away, when their children walked away, we all scratched our heads and wondered what happened, what went wrong. The terrible reality is that no matter what we do as parents, our children are free moral agents, and they will make their own decisions as to whether or not to follow Christ. And the harder you try to parent your children after they've left the home, whatever age that happens, the more you try to parent them and nag them, probably the more you're pushing them away. I found that to be the case. You have to let them go. You have to let them experience all of the terrible things of sinful lifestyle. Isn't that what the father did with his prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? He didn't force his son to stay. He simply gave him what he asked for and allowed him to leave. But I have to think that that father sat on his front porch every day scanning the horizon, hoping that his son might return on that very day. But notice what the prodigal son does in that particular story. It's while he's feeding pigs, which no good self-respecting Jew would have ever done. It's while he's feeding pigs in a time of famine that the Bible says he came to his senses. 
And he said to himself, the slaves in my father's house have a better lifestyle than this. I will arise and go to my father and basically say, hey, don't take me back as a son because I don't deserve that anymore. Take me back as a slave. Let me just live as a slave in your house. That's all I want. Surely my father will do that. I want you to notice in that story that in the depths of his depravity, in the depths of his dysfunction, in the depraved depths of his experience, the prodigal remembered the character and nature of his father. And he turned around and he went home. He remembered some things about his father. If I could write a book on how to raise your children in the Lord so that they would never, ever, ever, ever do anything foolish, I would make a ton of money. And I wouldn't have to work for a church for the rest of my life. It'd be great. I wish I knew exactly what to say to you to tell you because, you know, I'm starting out with kids and so I know everything at this stage. We know that there's no wise man on top of the mountain. We know that there's no silver bullet parenting strategy to make sure your kids stay faithful the rest of their lives. So at that stage, we ask the question, well, what can we do? Brothers and sisters, we teach our children this book. So that when they are living a life in the far country, even in the depths of their depravity, their despair, and their dysfunction, they say with the psalmist this phrase, I do not forget your commandments. Seek your servant. The prodigal can never fully forget the word and will of his father if it has been ingrained into his psyche. And my personal hope for my children is that regardless of the good or bad choices they make in their life, they will always remember what the Word of God says because their father and mother taught it to them. And no matter how far they go astray in the far country, they will come to their knees at some point and pray this prayer to the Father in heaven, Seek your servant, for I remember your commandments. i got to tell you, if we teach our children what God has said in His Word, they might run for the rest of their lives but there will be something in their mind that constantly calls to them to remember the nature and character and goodwill of their heavenly father. And it will be a struggle for them not to come back home. I promise you that. I want to close tonight with a poem that my father loved very dearly. It's a poem that was written on the inside flap of the Bible that he preached from. There's a phrase from the last stanza that I had put on his tombstone. It's a poem that I heard often because this was one of my dad's favorite sermons and he would read this poem at the end of that particular sermon. It was one of his tryout sermons when we would go to a church to perhaps investigate as to whether or not we wanted to go there and labor. It was a sermon that he would often present. So it was a, a poem that I heard often and I can recite it by heart, but I'm going to read it because if I start reciting it, I'm going to tear up. So this is a poem written by Carl Bates when he was a student at Freed Hardeman. It is simply entitled, The Bible Man, and we will close with this. He stands behind the sacred desk, a book held in his hand. And as he speaks, his brethren know he is a Bible man. Upon the scriptures, right and true, he ever takes his stand. To make the gospel clear and plain, he is a Bible man. He loves the grand old book divine. He loves to preach the plan. He loves the lost, its message saves. He is a Bible man. Let skeptics doubt and heathens rage and build their hopes on sand. He loves and lives and teaches God's book. He is a Bible man. And when worlds shall end and stars shall fall and at the throne we stand, how sweet to hear the king's command. Come home, you Bible man. It is God's will for all of us that we be Bible men and women, boys and girls, to be people of the book, to know the scriptures which are able to make us wise for salvation in Christ Jesus, that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work, that through the comfort and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. It is God's will that we be people of the book so that we can be shaped into the image of Christ. Maybe you're here this evening and you're not a Christian. The Bible says if you'll put your faith in Christ, Turn from your sins and be buried with him in the waters of baptism. You can leave here tonight as an heir of eternal life. 
For many more of you, maybe you're here and you are a Christian, and yet you know that there are some changes that you need to make before it's too late. If you have a need to respond for any reason, we want you to come as together we stand and sing.